Hello and welcome to Coffee Time. Coffee Time is a space where magical humans come together for some real talk, strong coffee, and powerful introspections on whatever is top of mind right now. My name is Natalie and I am your host for this channel and today's super exciting conversation. The idea behind Coffee Time is that you are in your favorite coffee shop, maybe cozied up with a book, and you begin to listen in on an intriguing conversation between folks at the next table over. For that reason, there is no big introduction. We absolutely let the conversation speak for itself. And if you do want to know more about these special guests following today's episode, I invite you to check out the show notes for more details. So on that note, let's dive right in. Hi, can you hear me? I can now. How's it going? Good. How about you? Good. I like your earrings. Thank you. Yes. I figured if I'm not going to wear a black lipstick today, I need I need to at least wear my pentagram earrings. Exactly. I kind of had this feeling we'd show up with like almost the same shade lips and I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> like we're both wearing white and it's, yeah. And here we are. Here we are. Yeah. Um, how was your full moon? It was lovely. Yeah. My full moon was great. I held a full moon, like a bit of a full moon circle. Oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, with some people and we were releasing blocks, like releasing all the obstacles that have been keeping us back from our goals. So that's what we're doing. My cat's going to be in and out of this. <laughs> mm-hmm. She's a Leo, so she loves to be on camera. So does mine, but he's taking this opportunity. He's, he's having an allergic reaction right now. So he's like, oh, mom's distracted. I'm just going to go bite myself in the corner. So yeah, he's, fair yeah enough. The other day I walked up and he'd been sitting like an old man, like, you know, like this and then I walked over and he like moved his paw to cover the spot he'd been biting and I was like you sneaky little bastard oh my god they all, they're so sneaky they do it all the time yeah oh she's so cute um yeah. yeah so that sounds awesome and also so fitting because I was like reading your little thing of like what you're all about which is just basically helping people live their awesome and I'm, I my first thought was like but what if I don't like, honestly, the thing I've been dealing with a lot, which you've seen a little bit scattered throughout the social mm-hmm. medias is like, but what if I don't deserve it? And I think that's exactly well, what you're talking about. Like, that yeah. Of getting to that step where you can even think like, I get to have these things. And like, for me, the full moon brought up that I don't let myself dream big, not even set. Oh, that's such a huge dream. one. I encounter that so much. I used to have that too. And um, so I, I feel you on that. Mm-hmm. So what's like, um, what kind of have you noticed has come up a lot around that? I know for me, it's like, I'm not even at a point of like journaling about it, but I figure like even recognizing like, Hey, you know what, this can be that next thing is oh, like yeah. starting to be right. But. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, um, like, so I was fired from my job a little more than a year ago now. So it was like a year and a month. And I had already like, it was a week after I'd hired a business coach and I was like planning, like, I'm going to quit in six months. I'm going to make enough money to quit and start this business and whatever. And so when I was fired, I actually took it as like the universe just pushing me out of the nest being like, no bitch, it's now you're going now. (laughs) (laughs) So I mean, like I was grateful for it, but like I struggled a lot with shame and deservingness in the beginning because Like, even though outwardly I was so relieved and so grateful to have left that job, um, I still felt like, oh, I've never been fired from, like, a big girl job before. Mm. Like, I've been fired from books a million. Like, that's fine. Like, in college. But that was, like, a big deal to me. And so for the longest time, I didn't recognize it. And I, like... um, so it was like, I, I, but I would have dreams about like being fired in front of the whole staff or like, you know, I was naked at my job and then I was fired, like lots of dreams like that. Yeah. And so I think because that's what was functioning under the surface, I struggled a lot with um, kind of claiming my desire, which is like, mm-hmm. and really like admitting that the things that I want are just things that I want and they're unique to me and it doesn't make them good or bad, even if other mm-hmm. people don't want them. So like a good example of this is, um, I'm manifesting fame. Like I'm not trying to be like regionally well-known. I want to be like, you know, multiple books. I want to be on like a speaking tour. I want to be a household name. I want to be like Marie Forleo level. And I felt so shadowy about that for so long because it's like, 
we're told not to dream big about things like that. And so I felt like that was a really shallow thing for me to want. I really judged myself for it. And then I remembered, I, I thought back and it was like, you know, when I was a kid, I was like, even before I really understood the concept of it, you know, my parents, like as a young child, when they were like trying to get me to clean up my toys or clean my room, like, what are you going to do when you're grown up and like, you don't have somebody to like clean up after you? And I would say, well, I'm going to be rich and famous. I'm going to have a cleaning lady. I would say it like it was like, duh, like, yeah. <laughs> and I realized that like when I went, when I looked at like, you know, this, the little version of me who was, who didn't have the conditioning, didn't have the shame and the shadow, didn't have people mm -hmm. who would like, you know, put her down for the things that she wanted. She wanted to be famous and she didn't know for what, but she knew she was here to like be seen in a really big way. And so I was like, well, if it was there at the beginning, then it can't really be, be inauthentic, can it? Because it's like, I knew that before anybody told me otherwise. And I didn't judge myself then for it. I didn't think it was wrong to say that or believe that. So I kind of got back in touch with that version of myself where I was like, you know, I'm not going to shame myself. How about I don't shame myself for it? How about like, would I have shamed my four-year-old self, my five-year-old self for thinking that? Absolutely not. So like, what if I just didn't shame myself about it now? Mm -hmm. And so now I've kind of like stepped into this place of like, you know, I'm, I'm really experimenting with like fully claiming my desires, free of shame, free of influence from anybody else, no matter what that looks like. Like I want to be rich and famous, so why not? Like, and there's nothing wrong with saying that. Some people might judge me for that. And the people who I think tend to judge us for things like that are the people who want it and they're afraid to say so. Right. So, so that's really like how I've decided to do. I'm really experimenting with like really getting into claiming what I want and owning what I want and not judging it. So that's awesome and super powerful. And like also for me currently feels kind of inaccessible because I guess like it's interesting to me that as that like five, six, seven year old self, you had such a clear idea because that's something that I'm currently working through is like recognizing that one, I don't remember a lot of what I thought and happened when I was growing up. And it's not that there was anything necessarily like objectively terrible. Um, I think it's just, there's obviously a lot that has not been processed because I was not ready to process it. Right. Right. And, yeah. I bought that book you recommended to existential kink and I'm looking into some other ones. Um, but like, what would you say, I guess, and this is definitely coming from self, self motivated ask here, but yeah. like, what would you say is a first step if you don't, if you're not in touch as much with that initial thought that you had to begin moving down that road? Cause it's like, all of us deserve to have that dream or that vision for ourselves, but like, how? I would say like, what do you want now? And like, what's at the core of it? Like, what's the emotion you're trying to experience from it? Um, because like for me, I guess being famous is, it's partially about freedom mm. and it's partially about uh, being appreciated and like being seen for who I am. So it's like, it's a, con it's a combination of a few flavors. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is like, you know, people talk about this in manif manifestation all the time where it's like, you need to embody what you want before you have it. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about like what it is I'm craving from being rich and famous, it's like freedom, like freedom to do what I want, go where I want, when I want. And I don't have to consider other people in that process unless they're like, you know, a part of that decision. So it's that. And then it's also being seen and being appreciated for who I am. And also like letting people in and inspiring others. So I try to bring that into my everyday life. So that's really what I, what it is now. And so, and I think that as you embody the things that like the emotions that you're trying to experience, you start to get clearer on what it is that like, what that really looks like for you and your version of it. So like, you know, some people might want the same things that I do, but they feel content with, you know, a nice like social media following or a smaller group of friends or, you know, just a business that just meets their needs so, and I think it's like my, the reason mine is so big is because like, I want to change the world. 
And I want, there's so many things in life that like in the world that we live in that I want to be different. Mm -hmm. And so that I know I could easily change, maybe not easily, but I could inspire that change mm -hmm. if I had a world stage. So it's like, you know, if you want to change the world, you need a much bigger platform. Yeah. I like that you mentioned the flavors because I actually was on a full moon thing last night myself, um, hosted by... Mm -hmm. Elsa, who's been on another episode of this show, and she was channeling a message for us from the records. And what came up was that it was talking about, um, like, it's time to like cook or to bake and to bring together all these spices, but the spices are, you know, like you have your cinnamon and that might be like your yoga and your ginger might be like drinking more water and like those little mm. building blocks, but it's like, you get to create this like delicious pastry or delicious dish that is your life by pulling together those spices that you desire. I love that. Yeah. That's a great way of putting it. And that's like, you know, that, that's such a great way to explain like the concept of manifestation as well. Right. It's like, it's really just a, a culmination of beliefs and actions that we take that uh, give us the life that we want and the life that we're craving. I like that. See, and I've always been, and I'm like pretty upfront about this, really resistant to manifestation, probably because of some of that other stuff I mentioned, but I think also because a lot of the communities I see talking about it, it feels very, very superficial, very surface level. And like, you know, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of things that seem very problematic. Um, right. Oh, of course. Yeah. It's yeah. like, Basically, like this idea that like, you know, um, everything, like everything we have is manifest is manifested. So it's like, well, how do you explain systemic oppression? And like, there are very real, like there are very real effects of that. And like, what I actually really love is like, I don't know if you know of Lacey Phillips, but she's like a manifestation expert. Yeah. And like she recently, that was like my big criticism of the platform too, is that they kind of like it was kind of a bit steeped in white privilege in the sense of like, you know, it's acting as if um, like there is no systemic misogyny or systemic racism that holds people back. Yep. And actually after all of the Black Lives Matter protests started in May, they added that to every single thing that they did where they talked about like systemic oppression and how like there are some things that are outside your control. And, that, and like really when you think about it, it's like, and this is just like my speaking for myself. It's like we as a society, yeah, we manifested some really fucked up shit. Like we created those things because like we were coming from a place of racism and of hate hatred of other people. Mm -hmm. And so those systems have been manifested. It's just that they were manifested from like a really um, shitty place and like a place of debaseness and debasing others. And so it's like, I like to believe that it can be manifested otherwise. I mean, like last night during my full moon clearing, like, I don't want to say, I will say that like, I was trying to not just release blocks for me, but a certain someone who is up for election in the United States. Um, yep. And then today I happened to wake up and find out that our president has COVID-19. And I was like, <laughs> did I do this? I don't know that I didn't do it. So well, here we are. <laughs> yeah, no, I saw that too. And I had a whole lot of thoughts, a whole lot of thoughts. Um, Cause there's, I think with that, and I feel like you portray this well within like your spaces online too, which is mm -hmm. probably why I've gravitated towards them. There's like spiritual bypassing is a legitimate thing. Oh, and, for like, sure. There yeah. has to be a balance between the more like practical pragmatic and like when to pull in these spiritual tools or observations based on the spiritual trends that were being shown. And like, yeah. I noticed that at the beginning of COVID was a lot of people saying like, this is the world up leveling. We're going through this thing. And like, I don't know if I can get taken off YouTube for saying this, but my first thought this morning was like, did all of this happen so that Trump could die from COVID? Like, I'm sorry. That was my thought. I was like, did that, did that happen? But also mm -hmm. it's like those things. And like, I'm in it right now, as I've been sharing a little more openly, gradually as I'm ready. Um, and the spiritual anchoring of like why I'm going through this shit has been oh, yeah. really helpful. It also 
and I need to be cautious of this as someone who's recognizing I have this trauma to process. And then I think we can like, as the word extrapolate to more of like a global scale, it's like using those spiritual tools to understand what's going on and, and maybe give a little more grounding to it cannot discount the trauma and pain that needs to be processed Mm. or that is being experienced. And in particular right now, that which is being experienced and always, but by the most vulnerable and marginalized members of society. So like, it's great that like the record said that the world is up leveling and we're moving 10 times faster and blah, blah, blah. But if this person can't feel safe going outside to get food for their kid at home, I don't really fucking care what's happening to the world right, exactly. from a spiritual yeah. perspective, you know? Yeah. 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 It's definitely like a time of shedding. And it's one of those things where it's like, we can um, sit here and talk about the world being like up leveled all we want. Anytime that anything is up leveled, like people have this idea that um, up leveling is just like, almost like meditating and surrendering to a higher state. And it's not, it is fucking painful. It, it, it hurts. Like it's not meant to be. It's not, not all love to... and light. No, 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 no. What? <laughs> and, um, yeah. So it's like, it's a painful experience, you know, even thinking about um, some of the scarier cards in the tarot deck, death and the tower, it's always meant to look at like, it's, it is. You pulled a, that it, one the other day. So I just, that's why yeah, I'm laughing. Yeah, My well, friend was I'm here and she pulled the tower and I'm like, my life. It's fine. Let's yeah. <laughs> but like what comes after the tower is the star. And it's like, you know, the, there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. And, but the thing is, is that like the only way through fear, through pain, through trauma is to live through it and to feel it and to express it. And so it's not good to sit here and think like, well, I just need to like meditate my way through it. Or I just need, we just need to stay positive. We can only look on the positive. No, we need to full, feel the full pain Mm -hmm. of what we've created and what we're experiencing. And like, you know, on a personal scale, like, you know, with what you've been going through is like really mourning that is like Mm -hmm. mourning and feeling the, feeling the loss. And on a more like, you know, global scale, it's, it's rioting and it's protesting and it's, you know, clashing and it's like being outspoken and it's pain. And it's like exposing the world to like, like the truths of what marginalized communities are experiencing. Mm-hmm. It's like, you don't get to shut that off and say, well, it's because it's, a, it's because we're up leveling. It's like, yeah, we're up leveling. And that's why these things need to be happening. It's, it's meant to be happening right now. And we need to be paying attention to it. Mm-hmm. And it's like facing the full pain of that and the pain that like, you know, all white people benefit from racism. That's not an easy pill to swallow. And like, you need to get behind that and you need to face it and accept it. Mm-hmm. We got to have difficult conversations with the people who are close to us, difficult conversations with ourselves. There's no way to the other side except to go right through it. Mm-hmm. Reminds me of that Robert Munch book, Mud Puddle. Did you ever read that? No, I've never even heard I of reference it. I reference it to so many people and they don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. So it's like, um, this kid's in the backyard and there's a giant like animated mud puddle that's like, Rah! and the whole thing is like, can't go under it, can't go around it. And it's like, you can't. Oh my God, I love you know, it. You got to go through it. It's like that tunnel. And I always describe like fear as that dark, dark tunnel, but there's like that tiny little light at the end and it gets brighter mm. and brighter as you approach. Oh, yeah. Which is interesting. Cause I realize now I've like had experience in the last couple of weeks crossing spirits, which I've never done before. And that's what it looked like. It's this tunnel and there's this light at the end. At least that's what I see it as. And there's the light yeah. like, as you move towards it, it gets brighter and brighter and brighter and like more inviting. Um, but the initial pull is like in their case to like stay here and like hide in my closet or like in my case, right. it's like avoid this and avoid that. Cause I want to <laughs> go, you know, I want to mm-hmm. be comfortable. Um, and sometimes that's necessary. Like I think like I recognize this week I'm dissociating cause I've been overwhelmed and like, at least I'm recognizing it for once. Like, you know, sometimes yeah. that's the best you can do, but at a certain yeah. point, you're going to have to step back into that tunnel or like back into the mud. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Touch through. Yeah. yeah. It's so funny that you bring that up because like, I've been obsessed with the topic of fear lately. Like, and I think it, it started, it started um, about a month ago because I had started a flower remedy that was like face your fears. So it's like mimulus. And so 
Yeah. And like I had bought it, like I bought two flower remedies like over a year ago. And like, I'm in the phase right now where I'm like, I got all these supplements, all this shit I bought. And I'm like, okay, you either got to use it or throw it out. Okay. That's it. So it's like, so I started taking my vitamins again. And so when I looked at the flower remedies, like I was talking to my podcast co-host because she's like, I, I still consider myself a baby witch. She's like an advanced, like she's more of an advanced practitioner. And I had asked her, I said, like, you know, you know, these didn't really work. Should I give them another try? Or should I just get rid of them? And she was like, well, what were you doing with them? How long were you on them? Like asking me these questions. I was like, well, I was using both and blah, blah, blah. And she was like, oh, you're supposed to do one at a time, silly. Like just not both. Like the, they basically like they don't work. You have to do one at a time. So I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I was like, all right, well, and at the time I just come off like one of my lowest sales months in business. And I was like, I'd run out of money for the third time. And I had a lot of like fear and shame around that. Cause I was like, are you fucking serious? Like I thought I was past this, but I think it just comes to the territory of being a, being a money coach. I've got to experience all the money shit mm -hmm. all the time, like before anybody else does. Cause I have to teach it. And then two, living on my Pluto line, like, I've been born, born and raised on my Pluto line, so it's been a rough Can you explain time. that? I'm new. So, like, actually, because oh. the episode that just came out was my natal chart getting read, so I'm, like, fresh into it. Like, I don't oh, know my God. much okay. at all. So, yeah, tell, so, yeah. <laughs> so, apparently, like, based on – and I'm fairly new to this, too. I'm definitely not advanced, so I just know the basics. But, like, you – based on where you're born, like, you have different, like, planetary lines on the map of the world okay. and so there are some placements that are like really juicy for you to live and some places that are more challenging and so pluto pluto is like you know the the god of death so the planet of transformation and change mm -hmm. and death like transformation through death and so people who are born on a pluto line tend to be agents of change Okay. Like they're just geared toward it. Living on your Pluto line basically means that it's like a constant, like death and transformation, just mm -hmm. constant. And I've like always lived within a radius of my Pluto line my entire life. And when I discovered this a couple of years ago, I was like, well, no shit. <laughs> like that <laughs> makes so much sense to me. So basically like this constant, like this constant rebirth and this constant mm -hmm. transformation. And like people talk about it from the, from the place of like, it's hard to live on your Pluto line. It's really difficult. It's painful, but really it's just like, it's the same theme we've been talking about, which is like, you know, you're changing, you're up leveling so much, but it's a really painful existence. And so, so like, you know, I'd gone through, like I'd had my worst, one of my worst months, you know, it was August and I was feeling like really shaken up by things. And I was like, okay, well, you know, now is kind of like another make it or break it moment for me. And so I just need to kind of get over myself, start facing my fears, like really accept some hard truths. So I was out, well, that seems like the good one. It's like the face your fears remedy. So let me start mm -hmm. with that. And it was funny because like a week in, I had this feeling of like, nothing scares me. Like I just started feeling like, no, like the universe ain't going to throw anything at me that I'm like not ready for. I can, I can handle all of it. Like I just got like this, like, mm -hmm. it's not even like a bigness. It was more like a groundedness to me where I was just like, I felt like a really strong Oak tree where it was like the wind can rustle my feathers or my rustle my leaves as much as it wants, but I'm so well rooted. I'm not going anywhere. Like you send me a hurricane. If you want, this tree is not, not toppling oh, wow. over. So it had started with that, and um, sorry, I live, I live by a police station, and I'm I in do Washington. too, actually, which is why I was laughing. It's like, hey, it's not me. No, there's a fire hall slash police station, which is oh my God, a library so right funny. behind me. Yeah. Wow. That's <laughs> got to be a loud-ass library for... <laughs> right? The funny thing, though, is, like, I don't hear them that often, so I feel like they often wait until they're, like, just around the corner to actually start the sirens or something because it's but it's also a small area like I think you're in a bigger city I'm in like a yeah I'm in Washington DC and like yes. we have protests we've had protests constant since May so the police have been going nuts so so yes yeah, so I started this flower remedy mm -hmm. and a weekend I was like so feeling so grounded and so like ready to face any kind of fears and then in the month in in the month that followed 
not only did I have that like grounded oak tree feeling, mm. I just became really fascinated with like, and like really preoccupied with facing fears. Mm -hmm. And so like doing things that were a little bit outside my comfort zone and pushing other people to do it as well. And really exploring these different topics of fear. Like you saw in my Facebook group, mm -hmm. I did a whole fear series, like popular fears for entrepreneurs, what they mean, why we have them, how we can move through them. I just became like so fascinated and I have like, I was like, I started like researching stuff and I'm like, I came up with um, a whole process. So that was like my full moon. Like I did a whole full, full moon circle with people's a three day workshop. And basically like it was based from this place of like, let's figure out what your what like, cause your brain always has like an association with what your biggest fear is. So a lot of people will be like, my biggest fear in business is like running out of money or my biggest fear is having to go get a nine to five job. Like everybody has their thing that they think they're afraid of, mm -hmm. but on a subconscious level, they're pushing shit away and there's a representation of it. So like the example I'd had was like having like my greatest fear, yes, running out of money, but following it through to the deeper core fear, as I call it is, you know, I was afraid of having to move back to Florida because I, I hated it there. Like, I mean, everybody loves it. It's so tropical. No, I, I'm like, I've never like, understood, especially right now, why people would want to be, I had a friend who lives here now posting, like, I just want to be back in Florida where gyms are open. I was like, mm. no, ew, I, no. Yeah. You have healthcare. Like, what are you doing? Like, yeah. yeah, no, no. Oh my God. No. Yeah. So yeah, I'm like, you know, it's like, I, my fear was like, okay, having to move back to Florida, have to go, have to go back to like a boring attorney job. Cause like, you know, I'm still a lawyer. So it's like mm -hmm. having to like get a boring lawyer job and like I'm wearing suits to work every day. <laughs> and like, because I'm in Florida, my salary caps out at a certain point. And so it's like, I have to like live that life. And then, you know, what, well, what's the underlying fear of that? You know, cause that's like not that bad. And it's like, well, you know, it means that like, I'm basically like, it, it means that I'm just like my parents, like my, my parents. And so, and it was like, well, where do, like, what do I associate with like my parents and my mom and things like that, thinking about my mother, cause of, we're of the same, like, you know, gender identity. And so I was like, my mom is like a super saver and shops at Walmart. Like that's like her go, that was her go-to place growing up. And I realized that like what I was really afraid of, the representation of this fear of this alternative life that I would have to pursue if my business was not successful would mean shopping at Walmart for all my necessities because I couldn't afford more than that. Mm -hmm. And it's like, why? Because what do I stereotype those shoppers as? I stereotype them, me being a judgmental asshole myself. I'm stereotyping them for being poor, for being ignorant, uneducated, racist. And that is the core fear. Mm -hmm. The fear isn't running out of money. The fear isn't even becoming my mother. The fear is that if my if I run out of money and I my business tanks, it means I'm poor, I'm uneducated, I'm ignorant, mm -hmm. I'm racist. Mm -hmm. That's what it means. And like I've made these associations mean thing. And first of all, like clearly not all Walmart shoppers are that. But then the other thing is that I was already those things because I was making those yeah. judgments about Walmart shoppers. And so once I like realized that connection, I was like, well, the solution is I got to go to Walmart. I got to go do all my shopping at Walmart and I have to do the things that I'm afraid to do. I got to go try on a bra. I got to like buy all my groceries there. I need to like Exp have the Walmart experience. Go buy shit for my house. Like I had to do it. Like, and it's you so like silly. Branded. The Walmart experience. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's so silly because at the end of the day, it had nothing to do with Walmart. Mm -hmm. But because I was so afraid of that becoming my reality, I was like, you know, well, you can essentially, I can walk through a version of my greatest fear by actually just going and shopping at Walmart. And I say like your greatest fear in, in like business life, whatever, like you're going to walk through it eventually. It's going to happen. And it's going to happen one of two ways. I say it's like changing your car battery. You know, you have plenty of notice when your car battery is going. You got the light dinging. It's like making a noise. Every time you turn on, you turn on, it's like, mur, 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 and then it turns on, right? And you know, you know, it's going to die. And you got like, you really got like, like three options. You can either make an appointment, 
to go get the car battery changed and spend two hours of your time at the mechanic, but schedule it, have it like figured out. You can do it yourself. So like make the time to go buy the battery and then put the car, put the battery in and figure it all out. Or you can wait until it dies and it is always without fail in a parking garage at night, somewhere inconvenient like the mall. And then in the middle of the night. That's what happened on our end. Yep. <laughs> and then you have to like get a friend to come give you a jump or call a tow truck. It's like a whole big thing. And then you still wind up spending even more time at the mechanic because you didn't plan it. So now it's like you're, you're like after all the appointments have been made. Mm-hmm. So it's like you get to decide, am I going to wait for the universe to, to manifest my own worst fear so I can walk through it and see that it's not that bad? Mm-hmm. Or am I going to like walk through the representation of that fear and confront it? So that way it doesn't hold weight over me anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so that became the theme of this full moon, this full moon fear release, as I called it. I basically dialed into everybody's trips to Walmart. Like what's your equivalent to it? And then, um, so now they have all their assignments. So they all have to like, you know, walk through, I, I call it like, you know, you have to do your trip, take your trip to Walmart essentially. Yeah. And then I covered like popular fears around entrepreneurs and the thing, like the limiting beliefs around money that hold us back. And then we did like a, like a obstacle releasing ritual with um, Ganesha, who's like the the Hindu God of releasing obstacles. He's like the guardian. So Mm -hmm. we did that on the full moon. And so I've like become so obsessed with the topic of fear Mm -hmm. and it's like, and it's amazing because it's so empowering. And I call it like when you walk through that representation of your greatest fear, you always get like a huge confidence boost at the end. Cause you're like, it's actually not that bad. Like mm-hmm. you have to walk through it to realize I'm still worthy. I'm on the other side and I'm still worthy. Like, even if I, even if I become this person who shops at Walmart or even if I have to do this thing, I'm still worthy. Mm-hmm. And like, I call that, like, I call it a fear boner. Like you basically like inexplicably pop a boner based on fear. <laughs> That's like what it is. That's no, that's really powerful. And I think like, obviously my wheels are turning, like, as you're talking about this, cause I was like, what's my thing? What's my thing? And I don't think I quite know the, you know, the exact one. Yet, oh, I can walk you through it. Do you like, want me to walk you through it? Do we want to do that right now? I'm down. Like if you're ready. Well, that's the question, isn't it? But I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you some personal questions. So, you know, we can, we can do it after if you want, I'll tell, I'll tell you what your trip to Walmart is, but it's up to you. Let's yeah, let's do it. Okay. All right. So when ball so deep, think, first push, it's fine. Yeah. What do you think your greatest fear is right now? The thing that first came up when you were talking about that was being unlovable. Being unlovable. Okay. So um, what does it mean if you're unlovable? What does that mean about you? I'll just go with first thing that comes up. Is that yeah, how yeah. we do it? Yeah. yeah. Um, that I failed. And I'm undeserving. Failed and undeserving. What other kind of person is unlovable? Who's an unlovable kind of person? Like, talk about some qualities. Um, someone who maybe, I don't know, I haven't thought about that before, is like hateful or like spiteful, vengeful. Those are the kind of words that come up. Yeah. Hateful, spiteful, vengeful. Does, when you use those words, hateful, spiteful, vengeful, do you associate, does someone come to mind who you think of? Mm. <laughs> My father. <laughs> your father, okay. All right, and tell me a bit about your dad and your relationship with him growing up, yeah. Oh, that might be harder. Um, and I will also mention, because I'm big on like physical sensations, as soon as I start saying those words, I have like a churning in like my solar plexus. We're getting there. We're getting there then. That's a good sign. Which I did a lot of release on last week and that's why I'm dissociating this week because it was like overwhelming. Yeah. Um, growing up, we actually were quite close for a time, at least as far as I remember. Mm-hmm. Um, I also though know that in my head, like I was constantly trying to prove myself worthy of his love and attention, like Mm -hmm. with good grades or doing that. And then the other thing I've realized recently is like, I didn't get the support I asked for. So that's the other thing is like asking for help with homework. And, you know, he'd be like, well, 
here's your textbook, go do it. Like you don't need my help. And sometimes mm-hmm. you just want to be able to have someone's help, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, but I don't, I don't remember a lot. Um, I do, and I don't want, okay, also I should preface this with, I don't want any of this, if, when this is published, to come across as saying necessarily things about him, because also it's my- Oh yeah, no, this is a no judgment zone. Yeah, because like, for anyone watching though, it's like, okay, yeah. just so you know. Um, but I We do can remember. love our parents and still be critical of how we were raised. Like it doesn't, like it, it, this is a no judgment zone. And I want like the instinctual, like unfiltered answers, because that gets us closer to it. Well, so, I remember a dream. It wasn't mm. real, but I remember a dream that I had where I was in my room and I opened the door and the house was on fire and he was standing on the stairs staring at me and then just like left me behind. Mm. Um, and that was also at a time, and this is interesting that, you're, that we're getting here because I realized this morning when I was thinking like, what's my trauma? Like, I'm like, what is this? And like, I know I have to work through it and like figure it all out. But something I was realizing too, um, was this was at a time where I'm pretty sure there was like a trickster in my house and there was a lot of like supernatural stuff going on that I couldn't Mm. explain. And I think that was compounding a lot of the anxieties and fears that I had going on. And so like, whether that was about him or not, I don't know, but there, it was overwhelming fear all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you had mentioned like you're, oh, you were always trying to please your father, Mm -hmm. like work for his love, relatable. And, (laughs) um, you also like feel like for someone to be unlovable, it would mean that there's there's been some failure involved. Was there ever a situation in which your dad criticized you for some and you took it as a failure? Yeah, uh, grade seven, <laughs> we had to draw a, and this always comes up, a to scale replica of a sarcophagus. And mine was so detailed, but it wasn't like quite to scale. And I got a C plus, which like, to me, that's just also ridiculous. Cause you're like 12 years old and like, seriously, are you kidding me? But anyway, and he made a joke about my grade and I took it really hard. And like for the next few years, wouldn't even show him my report cards because I, I thought I was, you know, like I failed. What did he, what did he say? What was the joke? Um, oh God. It was something like, I don't think it was these words, but it was something along the lines of like, that's the best you can do. Like a C plus really like that kind of thing. Um, Cause I always got a go figure like A's and like some B's. Like I was, you know, 94% average and up for most of school. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when that happened and I think, cause I knew how hard I tried and like, I thought I did such a good job and then didn't. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Was there, did your dad ever criticize any kind of person or judge any kind of person either? No, either like it could be a specific person. Like did your dad ever criticize or praise any kind of specific person, either like a family member, like an aunt or uncle or another sibling or something general, like poor people or rich people or like a certain famous person? Um, He definitely values money (laughs) so that um, in a different way than I would. Um, He, I guess, I don't know who he would have made fun of, but he valued people who worked hard. Like what I saw him doing was being a workaholic, like all the time. And his job was everything. And um, like, that was how he showed his importance. And also he he definitely held his intellect over other people. So it wasn't necessarily like an outright, like, you know, uneducated people, blah, 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 are bad or anything like that. It was more like, look at me. I didn't have a formal education and I'm so good because I'm making all this money. Was there anyone he had a difficult relationship with other than you? (laughs) Um, His brother. Okay, tell me about their dynamic. They, I think. (laughs) And what's, what's his brother like? Oh, he's cool. I like him. Um, Yeah. I, for them, it's like a, I think it's like a competition to prove who's better, like constantly, because they both love the attention. And, um, 
So it was a constant struggle back and forth between that and like still is. Like when they're together, you can see that they're butting up against each other, trying to be like, well, look what I have and what I'm doing. No, but look at me and what I'm doing and mine's from Italy and, and on it goes. Mm-hmm. Okay. But, um, so what's, uh, what's your uncle like? Like, tell me about his personality and what he's like. Um, he's funny. Mm-hmm. He's, I feel like a little sarcastic, which I enjoy. Um, he's an artist, so very creative, um, I think driven. I mean, I don't know him super duper well, but that's kind of what I see at the face of it. And, um, I think values family a lot. Like, Mm -hmm. I I think he's pretty close with like his two kids and yeah. Um, okay. Do you admire him? Like, do you feel, do you relate to him? Do you admire him? Yeah, I think like we, like I said, we don't know each other super duper well, but whenever we've talked, like I think we connect that way. Cause I think we both, we both like, I don't know, it's that balance of structure and creativity. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And they've always like, in like when I was living in Toronto, I ran into one of them or something and they found out that I didn't have anywhere to go. And like they made a point of inviting me over for Thanksgiving dinner, which like, I don't normally celebrate Thanksgiving, but just to have someone to be with because everyone else is with their families. And I was vegan at the time and they like made sure that there was food that I could eat at dinner, which that brings up something is that in the last couple of years when we would go to my dad's house for different parties and and whatever, and he gets a caterer and all this stuff and um, that he wouldn't try to make sure there was stuff I could eat. And Hunter actually used to bring that up and say, like, it's not, like, that's not okay. Like, you're his daughter. Like, why isn't he doing this? And I would brush it off. And I would actually get defensive towards Hunter. Because I was like, don't judge him. Like, it's just how he is. It's fine. Let me deal with it. And what I realized the other day was that that was actually coming from a place of, like, I was getting defensive because what it brought up for me was that I didn't deserve to have him do better. And yeah. that was easier to accept than to think that I was deserving and he wasn't doing better for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sense. Yeah. Yeah. I want to go back to the C plus you got on the sarcophagus. <laughs> what did you make that mean? When your dad made that joke, I want you to get, not now, I don't want to hear the nuance from adulthood. Mm-hmm. I want you to get into baby Natalie's head. And like baby Natalie thinks in black and white. Like we all think in black and white as kids, even up through teenage years, we don't understand nuance. So I want you to remove the adult filter. Mm -hmm. What did you feel? What did you make it mean when he made that joke? It was, um, I think, well, I think what, I probably at the time knew too, like school was my everything. Like that's always been my safe place. And I mean, it's funny because you say like at that age, we think black and white, but I'm like, I'm an alcoholic. I always think black and white. Like it's, it's not going away. Um, And like my whole identity was gone. And the Mm -hmm. thing that I had used to get love, to feel okay for myself, all of it was gone. Mm -hmm. And so I think I just felt empty and lost. Like, honestly, I didn't know what to do. Yeah. What's your relationship with your dad like now? I know you've mentioned the vegan food thing, but like outside of that. Um, We haven't talked really since last December. Yeah. Okay. Um, There was a thing that, well, there was a couple things that I guess happened. Um, One of them being a post I made about my feelings around holidays and how it's been difficult and it's been difficult because, and, and I share this pretty openly, like holidays have been difficult because I don't remember the good stuff and it's not to say it wasn't there. It's just, I can't, I can't remember things and obviously trauma to process. So Mm -hmm. that's why. Um, But that made it hard to go back because holidays are this environment of like, it should look a certain way, right? Like that Hallmark family Mm -hmm. Christmas. And I didn't know how to show up that way. So like I had to distance myself. And what I shared about that was taken very personally, which was not the intention, but unfortunately that's what's happened. Um, and so we haven't actually talked really since I had mentioned to him that I was engaged last November, December. Um, and this got brought up again and I kind of 
set a boundary of treating those two things separately. And then I haven't heard from him since. Hmm. Okay. So, um, my wheels are turning. Did you, um, I want to know if you have a pattern with people. It can, it can be with anyone outside your dad of, um, hiding, like hiding parts of you or not sharing things or like being like unsure of how they're going to react to you. Like, ha has that been a theme? Yes. Um, I think I don't often communicate the things I'm processing and feeling, um, one, because I don't know if I'm ready to process them myself. And I think the other part of it is definitely like a, a fear that they can't handle it. Like mm. sometimes, um, especially with like my health stuff and the kinds of thoughts that it has brought up in the past. Um, and it's scary because like once you say it to another person, it becomes more real. Of course. Yeah. Do you, um, are you very careful in how you argue with people or disagree with people? Like, do you, you're like super focused on eye language and like, you know, you're very, um, cognizant of like, like you process things really like a long time before you even say anything. I, well, if it's like very emotionally heated, like I can argue in the moment. Um, but generally, yeah, I need a lot of time to process. So like, I'm the person where we'll watch a movie and then you'll be trying to debrief with me on it. And I'll be like, I need a couple days. And then I'll have like this essay prepared of like all the things. Cause I've just mm -hmm. been ruminating. Um, yeah. What about like in relationships, if you have an issue with somebody, is it like you, you take a few days to like collect your thoughts and then you present it? Most recently, no, but standardly, yes. Like, yeah. yeah. So that's the default setting. Mm -hmm. So I think your core fear here is actually, um, it's actually becoming your uncle. And it's because your dad, you perceived it as rejection from your father because like they were having friendly competition, but kids who think in black and white, who don't really understand nuance, who don't understand like, this is fun and games. We enjoy arguing. We enjoy one upping each other, one downing each other, whatever it is, mm -hmm. you perceive that as rejection. And so I think that what's going on there is that it's like a fear of stepping into who you are in multiple ways. And I think it's a dual, I think it's a dual situation of like being too afraid to fail, but too afraid to succeed mm -hmm. because like you don't like you have perceived that another person who was fully themselves and successful was rejected by your father. But then you also had the fear of when I've actually failed, I'm rejected by my father. So what you're, what's happening is that like, you're never allowing yourself to do either fully. So you, you feel stuck. Mm -hmm. So you stay in the middle all the time. So it's like, what's happening is that like, when things start to like, feel like failure, you'll kick up the heat and you'll move it back up. But if you start to succeed too much, you'll pull back. You almost get scared of it. And so that's why, like, if you've ever been in business, it's been like great months, low months, great months, low months. Like it's never been consistent. And also I would venture to say that your self-esteem is either, I call it, I'm the shit or I'm dog shit. Like there's no, it, like there's no in between. And so for you, you're thinking for the most part, we tend to think I need to find a way to stay up here thinking I'm the shit all the time. That's actually not it. You want to have a medium sense of self. So you don't live in those extremes because living in the, I'm a fucking legacy. I'm a, like, I'm a incredible. I'm the best human to ever walk the earth. That burns you out. Nobody can maintain that. And so, and it always plummets you right back to here. So the goal that you need to meet is actually in the middle. It's that oak tree situation. It's like, you want to get into like oak tree territory. We don't want to be like way up here. We want to be, and we don't want to be down here. We want to be in the middle. So the main thing, and I would, so the main thing I would say, like your trip to Walmart that you need to do is like the next time you have an issue that you want to bring up with somebody you care about and that you can't take time to think about it. You have to communicate poorly and you have to like get, like I would even venture to say like, find somebody whom you love and like stoke a, comp a competitive conversation with them 
Because that would make you feel really uncomfortable to not necessarily be like, I'm the best or I'm better than you, but like control. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, It's like, you need to like, you need to stoke a conversation with somebody you care about that feels a little bit competitive, whether it's like my life is worse than yours or whether like I'm going through harder shit than you, or whether it's more like, you know, well, I'm doing better at this than you. Like you need to, I think you need to recreate confrontation and competition so you can create a new association with it. Mm. And so I think you need to get a little competitive over something. And I would say, do it with somebody you care about and like, let them get mad at you. <laughs> let them get mad at you because I have a feeling there's a, there's a lot of codependence going on too, where when I people are mad at too. you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you really struggle with people getting mad at you. Mm-hmm. And so I would say like, have a conversation over something that has either been bugging you or something that you want to talk about with somebody. Don't be careful with your words. Let them come out. Let yourself be an asshole for a little bit. Yeah. Are you cringing like so hard inside? Yeah. Yeah, This feels (laughs) really uncomfortable. You don't want to like hurt someone, you know. It's not about hurting their feelings though. And it's like, here's the thing is that like, I get really triggered and I completely understand this. I get really triggered by people who are not careful in their communication Mm-hmm. And it really bothers me. I, I have like one of my brothers, I tend to fight with a lot. We always get into arguments or we used to, I feel like we're, we've made a lot of progress, but the reason it bothers me so much is because on some level I'm jealous that he has this thing in his brain that says, I don't have to worry about what I say because she's always going to love me. And I don't have that. I think that I need to be careful and I need to be considerate, not necessarily because I don't want to hurt people, but because I can't be loved if I speak without a filter. Mm. It's the same reason why Donald Trump triggers the fuck out of me. It's because on some level, I wish I could have the level of confidence and the level of self-assurance to just say whatever the fuck I want. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I put it, I, you would be surprised because I say a lot of crazy shit, but it's like, (laughs) I hold myself back a lot of the time, especially with the people I care about. And it's because on some level, I wish I could be uncensored. And so I would say that that's the thing too, is that like, you don't like confrontation. You're very careful about how you communicate with people because at the base, like your mo- like a formative experience for you was seeing confrontation leads to rejection. Mm-hmm. Confrontation and being who I am leads to rejection and so does failure. So you're basically like the, your trip to Walmart is that you have to have like an uncomfortable conversation where you just let shit out and you get a little competitive. Mm -hmm. And if like you're, and if it's making you uncomfortable and you're like cringing inside, then I know, then that's how, you know, you've hit, you've hit it on the head. You've hit the nail on the head. Yep. It makes sense. Um, cause I think also most recently, um, the situations in which I had those sorts of interactions have led to me feeling rejected. Uh, even if that's not exactly what is going on, that's how it feels with the current situation. Um, and I need to, and similar to how I need to accept that the current situation is not the end of the situation. It's like, it's just where we're at right now. Um, also exactly that it's like, what you're saying, like having that confrontation doesn't mean this thing is like a relationship with a friend or whatever is going to just fall apart. Like you can, and it doesn't have to be mean. Like you just need to voice your opinion on something. You like, I know basically I I'm saying like, I see it in you because I recognize it because I have it in me where it's like, you'll carry a good amount of discomfort about interactions you have with the people you care about where you're like, I don't like how they said that to me. Or I don't like how, I don't like how they, do this thing all the time where it's like, maybe they cancel plans at the last minute or something, or maybe like, you know, a good example is like, my sister is more careful with her communication with other people than she is with me, which is funny because that's like my trigger. Right. (laughs) So it's like, she'll be like, I feel like when we're in a group setting, she's mean to me. That's like, and it's not one-on-one. It's only in a group setting. Like she's more critical of me. And so I, it's easier for me to just live with that discomfort and expect it. And like, just adjust myself to accommodate that behavior rather than being like, I've noticed that when we're in a group setting, you're mean to me and you criticize me. And I don't like that. That hurts my feelings. And rather than, and, and I would not want to have that conversation because I have to be like you 
I would have to be like, you do this and this is what it does. Rather, like if I'm going to have that conversation, the way I tend to do things is I'll like plan it all out. I'll think about how to bring it up and like away and like, you know, have a whole thing rather than like, I'm just going to call her up and be like, you do this thing and it really bothers me and I don't like it because I know she's going to get defensive and I know she's going to lash out. Mm -hmm. And so that's the thing is that like, you, you're probably carrying around these small discomforts with people. And that's one of the nuggets that you need to find. So find one of those situations and just bring it up. Don't spend days thinking about it. I'm saying like today, tomorrow, like get into that full moon energy of releasing it, bring up one of these discomforts and just be like, you do this and it bothers me. Don't plan the conversation. Just have it out. I know. Right. And if they get upset, let them be upset. It's interesting though, too, because when you mentioned that about your sister, I'm like, I do that. I do what you're saying about her, but I have to wonder if it's kind of like, if we're talking, I don't know if it, what chakra it's related to right now, I'm feeling it in my gut, but like, I feel like it's a bit of that slash throat chakra of like voicing these things in the moment. And, um, I have to wonder if I do that because I'm out of balance on this other side of the spectrum, right? Like I'll shut people down and control the conversation because when that's happening to me, I don't speak up about it. So I grab hold of every easy opportunity to do it that I can. Yeah, probably. That's probably what it, what's happening. Because my sister's the same way. The only reason she's doing that is because she feels comfortable to speak up in those situations. Mm-hmm. She's like the queen of neutrality in any kind of family disagreement. She's like, don't involve me. Don't talk to me. Don't put me in the middle. I don't want to hear it. Like, I don't even want to hear how you feel about it. Like, nothing. She's like, she, she uh, like goes into like her hidey hole. And I think because of that, it's only in these situations because she knows I'm going to forgive her. She knows I love her. She knows I don't care. You know, like I care, but I don't care. Like, she's my sister. I'm never going to be up. I'm never like, she'd have to like, like, purposefully kill my cat or something which she would never do like for me to like reject her she would never do that she's such an animal lover but it's like it would have to be so extreme for me to reject her that that's a place where she feels safe to do it so it's definitely that but it means that you need to voice your you need to voice one of these things Mm -hmm. because the more you start doing that like first of all you'll do it and you'll be like I wasn't even that bad like yeah we had it out and it was kind of messy but we had it. And I've given this advice to people before, like, especially with partners, because women do so much emotional labor, Mm -hmm. like in, in conflict and resolution and all of that every so often. And I, and it's, it's rare, but like, I recently gave this advice from a friend where it's like, she'd had like, like her husband was just like full on mean to her one day. And it's like clear because he's dealing with a lot of trauma in his family right now, but she's the safe person where he feels like I can let it out and I won't be rejected. And so I was like, and she was like, oh, I don't like, I left the house because I needed a break, whatever. And she was like, you know, what's, what's the advice? Like asking our group, ch- group chat. And I f- straight up told her, I was like, oh, he wants an outlet. I was like, this isn't acceptable for him to do. I was like, so you need to go back and have it the fuck out. You need to like put on your boxing gloves and be like, you want to fight? Here we go. I was like, you're a Scorpio. You need to get into like your crazy bitch energy. Um, Because I say, like, sometimes you got to remind your spouse that you could kill them in your sleep, in their sleep, just so they know that there needs to be a baseline of respect there. I have to let the cat out of the bedroom. (laughs) So that's what I like to say is that sometimes the challenge is like to let go of all of the like careful communication that we've developed, especially if we tend to be people pleasers or if we tend to like try to do all the emotional labor in our relationships, it's important every so often to just let ourselves be human and have that fallout that we need. Mm -hmm. No, it totally makes sense. And I think it brings up a lot, especially with the current circumstances. Cause I'm like, but I did that. And, but that's also where I need to remind myself, like it's an ebb and flow. Like things won't look as you expected them to like, yeah, that person might decide to push away, but it doesn't mean I ruined things by right. It that. may have not done it with the right person too. It's yeah. like sometimes you need to do it with like the person you're afraid to do it with, you know, because mm-hmm. you're like, like think about um, like we tend to be more patient with our friends rather than our family. And I, I always say, I'm like, that makes like, it, it makes me sad. Like you should treat your family better than you treat your friends. Right. Like that's, it would make sense. 
but it's because our family feels like the safe space for us to like actually let things out Mm -hmm. because a friend doesn't have to see us at Thanksgiving. If they don't want to, they can go off and we'll never see them again. And so we will tend to like hold back on like friend conversations more so than we would in like a family setting. So like the challenge for you is like, you need to find somebody whose opinion you care about where you're actually afraid of losing the relationship to voice that concern and to voice it in a way that's not rehearsed and isn't super careful because like you need to live the experience of competition of like basically like conflict Mm -hmm. and like being okay with somebody being mad at you or having an emotional reaction to something you're saying, because otherwise you will forever shy away from the, from those things in the situations that matter. That makes sense. I have a person in mind. I just need to not pre-plan it. (laughs) Don't pre-plan it. Like, like hang, like the next time you have like a free hour, call them up and just say it, just get it out there, rip the bandaid off and just say it. Okay. I know, right? Like, it's got to, like, it, it needs to, like, get you in your stomach. Like, you're like, oh, It's uncomfortable because it's like, I'm fine. If I, I can just be fine. Like, I can be fine. I can be fine. Yeah, I can, like, tolerate this forever. Like, this it's is Like, fine. I clearly can be great without processing 29 years of trauma. Right? Yeah. Like, that's, right. that's got me to a really good place right now. So. Exactly. And, like, you're also the kind of person where you're like, but everybody's my mirror. So I just need to process it myself and then it won't bother me as much. No, the challenge, the worst fear that you got to work, walk through is you got to be in competition with your dad, you know? So you have to like live your uncle's side of that, of that, which is that I'm going to confront you and I'm going to like put my shit out there and like, feel like you're in competition in expressing your needs and like claiming what you want from them. That totally. And then being okay with them, being okay with them being mad at you or being upset with you or having a reaction to show yourself that like, it's okay to let people have those reactions. Mm -hmm. The best thing you can do as a codependent is learn to let people be mad at you and be upset with you. That's uncomfortable, but it's so uncomfortable. I am a recovering codependent and bothers me all the time. Like I made a joke last night with my partner about like phone plans and like, why aren't you on my phone plan? I was just joking. And then it like turned into like an argument and he got, (laughs) at me and so it's like I paused the show we were watching and I was like oh come in I was like trying to kiss on him and make him feel better and he was like I don't want to be touched right now leave me alone like I just leave me alone I just I'm upset Mm -hmm. and I don't want to deal with it it's like old me a year ago would have like spiraled and been like oh my god we can't move on until I fix it Mm -hmm. and instead I just hit play and I went back to like whatever I was doing and I was like I'm gonna let him be mad like he's gotta like I gotta let him be mad because he deserves to, to experience all his emotions at what, as well, even if I've caused them. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. That came up recently. Actually, I was in my records. I think I was in my records. Sometimes I just channel things. Other times it's like a structured approach. Um, yeah. And the thing that came up uh, to do with partner was like, the, to me, it was like, this is your incarnation to live. He has his own. Let him experience okay. that. And I think that's exactly it is like, and I was like, whoa. And it's like, you can know what you want, but you cannot write his will. Yeah. And that was like huge. And it might seem so simple, but especially for a codependent. um, Oh yeah. Yes. Oh my God. That's, and I think it's, that's the thing is when you're like in codependency, at least for me, it's like, you don't necessarily see that you're doing these things. So having that said to me, I was like, oh shit. And it made it a lot easier to step back and like, let that go and be like, why don't I just focus on my side of the street? Cause like, there's enough trash there that I need to clean up right now (laughs) before I worry about his (laughs) like, It's so funny because like, you don't feel like you're a controlling asshole when you're a codependent. You're like, but I care about them and I want the best for them. And that's why I'm doing this. It's like, that's what abusers say. It's the same thing. It's like, you're, it's just because like your methods are different. Doesn't mean it's good. It's still a bad thing. And like the thing that really like that packed a punch with me, similar to what you're saying is that like, cause I'm the oldest of four siblings. And so I grew up giving them advice and then I'm a projector in human design so like constantly. Oh my, both those things. Oh, really? I didn't grow up with all the siblings because two of them are step siblings. But yeah, I have three younger brothers and I'm also a projector. Wow. Okay. So you, so you get it when it's like you're trying to give them advice and they don't want it. Mm-hmm. And so it's like a whole life of being called bossy, like a whole lifetime of being like, don't tell me what to do. Stop telling me what to do. I was also told I should be a lawyer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. 
And so he, the, the thing is like what really like made me stop doing it. Cause I also have a young, a young cousin I'm really close to. She's 11 years younger than I am. And the thing that like put it all in perspective for me was, I think I had heard it on a podcast. Somebody said, like, think of all the lessons you learned through the mistakes you've made. Mm-hmm. Who are you to take away that experience from somebody else? And so- when I, the second I heard it, I was like, holy shit. Like there's so much value. Some people don't like, I'm one of those people where it's like, give me the advice because I don't want to live through shit. I don't have to live through, but like some people like, and I've come to accept like my sister, my sister needs to back herself into a corner in order to like figure her shit out. That's just how she is. And the, you know, and like not everybody functions that way. Who am I to take those lessons away? Mm -hmm. Even with my baby cousin, like she just, she makes terrible dating decisions all the time you know, not, not stuff I would do now, but it's like stuff I did when I was her age. She's doing all the same shit I did. And like, I don't want to see her hurt, but it's also like, she's going to learn things by doing them. And that's going to sit with her longer and be more valuable to her than me, like causing a whole argument with her to get her to stop hurting herself. It's like, Mm -hmm. and now it's just like, I've learned to roll with it. And until I'm asked for advice, I just don't give it. Yep. Yeah, no, that to- it totally resonates. And I think the thing coming up too is like people, when, like in your case, if someone gives you the advice and so you decide to actually take it, I think there's even still, maybe it's just a little bit quicker, but there's still that middle ground of like feeling through that process of like, right, yeah. okay, so if I don't go do this thing, like this is you know, that possible trajectory that I'm not traveling down and like still kind of processing that in maybe just a different way. But some people need the more explicit experience to figure yeah, out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Some people like just got to live through it. And it's like, it's just like different learning modalities, right? Some of us are auditory learners, some are visual, some are tactile. And it's the same thing with life. It's like some people want to learn via the advice of other people. Some people want to learn by doing it. And some people want to learn by like making mistakes. It's like, it's okay. There's no, there's no way that's right or wrong. Mm-hmm. So we just got to like kind of you know, get a handle on it and just like learn to let people live. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Codependent projectors. We need a support group. <laughs> so true. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. That, I mean, I don't know much about my human design. I'm going to be getting my thing read soonish, I think. Um, but I do know that what I have read makes a lot of sense. And like similar as I've been looking into astrology and then I did that. Um, what's that like? Uh, oh, fuck the the personality type quiz the enneagram I, yeah that i was like myers oh. briggs that's yeah. the letters yeah also made sense and just kind of seeing how they all come into play but i think the big thing of all of that is like it's a tool it's not an absolute yeah and that's what i try to yeah. remind myself cuz it's like I remember talking to someone once and they're like, how do I move forward in business if I'm a projector? Like I have to wait for an invitation. And I'm like, well, why can't your soul invite you to something that's right? Like right, yeah, I talk about somebody has to come out and be like, Hey, do this thing. And you're like, okay. Like, no. Right. So yeah. I get to- like invitations downloaded to me all the time. You know, it's like it, an invitation is what you, it's like when you're in touch with your intuition, you're going to get invitations from the universe as well. It's not necessarily oh, from a lot of them. Mm hmm. Oh, yeah. It's like you you you're going to get some explicit invitations of like, can you help me? Can you like can like can you give me advice? So you're going to get some of those. But you're also going to get like signs pointing you to a person like I say in business, like if you somebody who's watching all your stories on Instagram, they interact with every piece of content that you put out there. They may not have said like, hello, can you help me? but you see them interacting, I would take that as an energetic invitation to reach out. And when you reach out, it doesn't necessarily need to be like, here's some free advice or here's what I think you should do. You can reach out and say, would you like to talk? Like, would you like to set something up? And so that way you can like invite them to invite you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that absolutely makes sense. And I think that's the part where I was like, yeah, not, not quite. And I think tapping into that like intuition and that I call it my empath powers is really big oh, into yeah, finding yeah. grounding in that. Um, because like my soul is constantly speaking. Right. And it's like, it carries the wisdom of so many lifetimes and like my body is a tool to listen to that. So like, yeah, back and breathe and like, it'll come through. That's kind of how I see it. I love that. I, I have a feeling you're probably, do you have, um, do you know your authority in human design? 
because it sounds like you have solar plexus authority. I mean, that's why there's so much mm-hmm. shit going on there right now. Um, I don't offhand, but like after this, I could look it up quickly because I downloaded my thing yeah. and I could let you know, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me. Cause I, I'm an emotional projector too. Okay. And so I say that like anybody who has emotional authority, you got to sleep on it always. Cause it's like, we're meant to cycle through our crazy emotions and let them stabilize. Mm-hmm. So that way we can come to what feels like a settled decision. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, that, that totally makes sense. Oh, my cat is sweeping my floor now in case you heard him scratch. <laughs> He's like, mom, there's crumbs by my place, Matt. And he'll like sweep it all into a pile and then like walk away. That's so funny. That's really, I don't clean enough. So God, that is really funny. Yeah. He's hilarious. Um, but yeah, I'm going to go look that up. Actually, I'll message you in a bit. Cause I'm kind of curious now. Um, and thank you for helping me get to my Walmart excursion. Yeah. Keep me posted. I want to know how it works, how it feels. It's yeah. going to feel gross, but like once you do it, you're like, that wasn't even that bad. Yeah, I feel, yeah, I, it's probably true. Cause I also have to remember, well, one, it's like worst case I get through it. Um, but also like these people, like they, as much as I doubt it, it's like, they love me. Like we've been through shit before. Right. And mm-hmm. even with my current situation, yeah, the current circumstances don't mean that there is not immense love. And exactly. I exactly. need to remember that that can people will choose to love you even through this. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's huge for anyone. And like circling right back to our initial part of this conversation about that vision. And like, for me, like dreaming and like the people you work with, like, what is that thing? I think at the foundation of it, probably a lot of people is accepting that like, no matter what the relationships look like along the way, like there is still that love there and like, you still are deserving of it. And like, also can it might look different but like having it for yourself and like figuring out how to articulate that um because if i don't love me i'm in some way and i don't want to be like rad like love yourself 100 percent all the time like no it's not like that right like it's not lollipops yeah. and rainbows but that i think it, it can almost be like that level of sometimes it's just that compassion to have neutrality about your worth if you're not yeah we're on top of the world. Exactly. Like I said, you're not trying to go to like, I'm the shit all the time. You just want to be like at this place where you're like, I'm all right. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you don't need to be like, I'm wonder woman. You just need to be like, you know, I'm worthy. Like, and that's like, that's actually the middle ground because I say all the time, confidence and humility are exactly the same thing. A confident person doesn't walk into a party and say like, what's up bitches, I'm here, the party is here. You wouldn't consider that person confident. You would consider them like probably a little insecure and like overcompensating. Confidence and humility walk into the room and they look the same. Mm -hmm. They just like walk in, they walk up to somebody and start having a conversation, that's it, you know? So it's like, we often think that confidence is like this inflated sense of it, especially like, I think in American culture, that's especially true. Um, But it's actually more akin to humility than anything else. Mm -hmm. No, I love that. And humility is a big word. And that actually reminds me of the end of my journal last night, which I won't share the details because it's all burnt and buried in a plant now. But the very last part was just, I am here. I am here genuinely. And that's like the thing that I'm kind of, I don't know if it's calling in, but that was that essence yeah. that I want to embody. And that reminds me of exactly that, like walking into a room with genuine confidence and like being my whole complete self and like being okay with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this full moon, this is what's happening. <laughs> oh, juicy. Yes. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you so much for like all of this. Like we covered yeah. so many different things and I really enjoyed all of it. And I appreciate you sharing your expertise and also your personal journey with all of this too. Yeah. I feel like we could go for another three hours easily. (laughs) Well, we probably can. And if you ever want to come back on, uh, I am always always happy to come back. Yeah. (laughs) We have many topics. We could even, you know, do a card pull or something next time. So yeah, that would be fun. Definitely. Thank you so much for having me though. This was really fun. Thank you. I appreciate it. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode of Coffee Time. Before you leave, don't forget to hit that subscribe button 
And if today's show resonated, I invite you to drop into the comment section and share whatever personal introspection came up for you today. Anything you can do to help make the show more accessible is super duper appreciated. Until next time, I am your host and coffee drinking companion, Natalie, wishing you a beautifully caffeinated day.